nothing else that we can be sure than the love of God. Blessed Assurance is our next song. Isn't it so lovely that when we encounter Christ, he gives us a song to sing? What is that melody that he's teaching you to sing? Our next song is Come Thou Fount.
seated. It's now time for prayer, and as our custom is, uh, perhaps you have a special burden that you want to place before the Lord. God hears prayer from every place and every, at every time, correct? So why do we come forward? Perhaps there's uh, something that you just want to be very intentional about to bring before the Lord and sort of symbolically leave it here as you go back to your seat later. So if those would like to join me up front, we're going to pray together. Dear Lord, we come to you as a congregation, as a family, as your children. And Lord, we begin with praise because you are worthy of our praise. So we say to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Lord, we want to thank you specifically for answered prayer throughout this week, this past month, Lord, even our lives. And Lord, sometimes we get so busy from one crisis or trial to another that we forget to thank you for what you did before the next one is upon us. And Lord, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for the answered prayer. Thank you for keeping us safe. Thank you for blessing us, Lord. Thank you for our church family. Thank you mostly for Jesus who shed his blood, who interposed his precious blood that we could have new life and eternal life. And we worship you this morning for that. We, we, we worship you as our creator. What an honor and privilege to exist. You thought enough of us to create us and give us life. And Lord, we do not want to take that for granted. So we praise you and thank you. And Lord, we have many needs, Lord. You see your children here. And Lord Jesus, you are the great healer. And Lord, there are those among us that need healing. Uh, there are those that need financial blessing. There's those that need wisdom. There's those that, that need a sound mind. And Lord, we want to serve you. We want to give our lives to you. We want to share this great message with those around us. But sometimes it seems we're hindered by finances, worrying about paying bills rather than going about your business. It's hard to get up and get to church with those uh, stiff joints or, or sleepless nights because of sickness. So Lord, we pray you remove those things from us that we can go about your business and do the things you call us to do. Lord, we bring to uh, request, Lord, there's too many in the bulletin for me to name at this moment, Lord, but I lift it up to you, Lord. Answer these, we pray, according to your will. And Lord, we want to thank you for Pastor Mark, who will be celebrating 40 years of ministry, Lord, and we thank you for his vision and his heart for, the, for souls. Lord, we pray you bless him and his family, anoint them with special Holy Spirit to do the things you've called them to do in this place. Lord, we thank you for the group uh, Clarity and Friends who have a concert coming up. Lord, anoint these young people with your spirit to be a blessing far beyond these walls. And Lord, may that be true for each one of us, Lord, that we would find our place in this great work. Fill us with your spirit, Lord, that we would have the character of Christ, that we'd have the power to do what you call us to do, the wisdom to do what you call us to do. And Lord, finally be with the speaker of the hour. Put your word on her tongue that we would hear from you this morning. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. My
Good morning, boys and girls. You know, it's back to school Sabbath, and I'm wondering how many educators do we have in the sanctuary right now? Could you stand if you are an educator? If you are an educator, please stand. Okay, look at that. I think there's a couple. Oh, they're back there. Great. Okay, at the very end of the children's story, we're going to have a special prayer. You can go ahead and sit down. A blessing um, for our educators and our students. And so I'll ask you to come up and, and uh, at the very end. So I have something here. I need a helper. Let's see here. Come over here, honey. Oh, sorry. This backpack's a little heavy. How many of you have backpacks for school? And some of you aren't in school. Maybe you're in daycare. Yeah, backpacks. Let's see. One of the things that we often have for school is crayons. Yes. Okay. Just you, put, you can put that on your back. It's a little heavy. But I've got something in there to share. Uh, it's not gold. It's heavy, but it's not gold. So I have a pack of crayons, and I would like you to look in here and see if you can figure out which color is missing from there. Sorry, my arm is. So I, while the guys are doing that, I want to talk about crayons and people and how we are kind of like crayons. And I need to get my clicker. I, sorry, this is the first time I've used one of these. So everyone, pastor's going to help make sure it's, the clicker's on. I hope I go the right direction. All right. So I'm in school right now, okay? I'm learning how to use this. Okay, uh, let's see. Do I have to point a certain direction? Lay? <laughs> Just click. So the first picture should be of a bunch of crayons. <clears throat> nope, that's, that's too far. The very first picture is a bunch of crayons. Okay, so kids, did you figure out which color is missing? Yeah, I'm going to help right here. I'm going to help. What color is this right here? And my assistant over here is going to help me with that clicker. I'm not getting an A in class today. What color is this right here? Blue. So when you guys work on a project at school or at home, if you like coloring, how do you like it when one of the colors is missing from the box? Sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's a pain. If you're drawing a picture of the ocean, it's a pain if the blue is missing, isn't it? Can you help pass, pass these out right here? We've got crayons for each one, crayon boxes for each one of you in there. So I want to talk to you about how important it is that we have all of the colors of the crayons. Look at all of our church family out here. And church family, look at all of our children up here. If all of us were blue crayons, you can go to the next one. If all of us were blue crayons, our pictures would be pretty boring, wouldn't they? I mean, everything sky or ocean, that wouldn't be so great. We like to have other colors. But realize when we're missing a color, we're missing someone. When we're missing one of our church members, our picture is not complete. When we're missing one of you, our picture is not complete. And we have another picture that will remind you about how important it is for you to be you. Because that's how Jesus has made each one of us. He created each one of us to be special and have special gifts. And just like the blue crayon missing, when you're not part of the picture, the picture isn't complete. Now, what are some of the different gifts that you think that Jesus has given you to help him do ministry? Because each one of us has gifts. doesn't matter how old or how young we are. Anybody? What about you have the gift to give prayer, beautiful prayers? And you are a helper. You raised your hand first, but I wasn't close enough to you. Each one of us can do something special for Jesus that nobody else can do. I want to tell you right now, a story of a little boy named Stephen, and he, let's have our next picture here. Thank you. When Stephen is the little kid with that white funny thing on his head. When he was a year and a half old, he was in a car with his mom driving down the road, like you did this morning to church, going about 35 miles an hour, and his door opened, and he fell out. He was in a car. This is many, many years ago, because Stephen's a very old man now. And he, <laughs> and he, 
and he was in a car where the doors open differently than ours do. Your car door opens this way, and they open the opposite way. So he was leaned up against the edge. They didn't have car seats. He fell out, and he rolled down the road while his mom kept driving and realized he fell out. So Stephen had this bandage around his head. He has a huge scar. And sometime I'll introduce you to Stephen, and you can meet him, and you can see the scar on his head. It's about this big, a U-shape. Well, Stephen, God, was spared, God spared Stephen because God had something for Stephen to do, just like he does for each one of you. <clears throat> and Stephen grew older. When he was in the third grade, his teacher at school asked him to take his crayons out and said, students, I want you to draw a picture of what you want to be someday. What would you draw if your teacher asked you to draw something? I would draw me helping someone. What? You would draw you helping someone. What do you want to be when you get older? Helping people is wonderful. That's what Christians do. I would draw a microphone. You would draw a microphone. Okay. Can you hold I would draw um, pastries. Pastries. You want to be a, a baker? Pastry chef. I would draw myself as a scientist. Ooh, draw himself as a scientist. Anyone else? I'll draw myself as an art teacher. As an art teacher. Well, that's cool. Yes, one more. Um, I'll draw myself as a, uh, a car fixer. OK, an, uh, a car fixer, a mechanic. Well, little Steven was in the third grade, and he drew a picture. It's right up here of somebody, can you tell what that is? Somebody on the beach. Now, this is not the actual picture he drew, but this looks just like the picture he drew. And it was of him standing on a beach, looking over the ocean with a Bible in his hand. Stephen told his teacher he wanted to be a missionary when he grew up. But Stephen grew older and, you know, he didn't always put Jesus first in his life, and he didn't always, he was a good kid, but Jesus just wasn't right there always where he needed to be in Stephen's life. And when Stephen was 17 years old, a friend of his was in a car accident, and his friend died. And when Stephen was looking at the casket at his friend, like this picture right here, he said, you know what, my friend was a good, good man, and I know that when Jesus comes, he's going to go to heaven. And Stephen started wondering about himself, and he said, wow, God, am I ready if something happens to me? Am I ready? Am I following you and living the way I should live? And Stephen started praying a lot. And that summer, after that school, or during that school year, his senior year in high school, that's a picture of him right there, he... He was, you know, kind of scrawny kid there. He decided to give his heart completely to Jesus, and he felt called by God to be become a pastor. And so Stephen was saved when he was little. He had thought when he was in, in grade school he wanted to be a missionary, and then he sort of lost his way a little, and when he got older, he committed his heart to Christ, and he headed to college. But in college, he had a professor that looked at him and said, you're, can we keep these, you're not going to do well as a pastor. So here Stephen had committed his heart to Jesus, and then the professor says, the professor looks at him and he says, you're not going to be a good pastor. You, you shouldn't even bother trying. He got very, very discouraged, so he decided to take one year out of college, and he went to work doing construction, which is that next picture. Well, he and his buddy had a whole bunch of houses, jobs lined up to build, and what do you think happened? When God calls us to do something and we don't follow what he asks us to do, what happens? Not good things. It was like Jonah and the wife of the, the other man who was going to build houses with him started calling Stephen, Jonah, you're Jonah, just get off the ship. We had all of these jobs lined up and now we don't have any work. So Stephen listened and he prayed and he said I need to go back to school and I need to finish 
So Stephen went back and he finished his senior year at college and he was remarkably the first person in his class of 29 pastors to get a call to serve in a church. There's another picture here. And one of the pastors of the conference came over and shook his hand, and he said, we want to hire you. And he started thinking, wow, God has saved me many times. I felt called to be a pastor or a missionary, and then I sort of lost my way, but then I committed my life to Jesus, and here I am, I'm getting a call to serve. And so over the years, and I can't remember what my next picture is. Can you prompt that? Over the years, I don't know if you know who this is, but this guy, Pastor Stephen, started doing rock climbing and lots of outdoor ministries for the North American Division. He actually did the very first rock climbing invitational for the Pathfinders in North America. And the Pathfinders just met at Oshkosh last week. Anyways, that guy is up there getting ordained right now, and that's a special time when there's a prayer for the pastors. And does anybody know yet who that Pastor Stephen is? Does anybody recognize him in these pictures? Any of the kids? Anybody have a yes? Okay, let's go to another picture here. There's Pastor Stephen a little more recently with the two guys he was ordained with. Does anybody recognize him now? Anybody recognize him? Yeah. Pastor Mark. <laughs> His name is Stephen Mark Etchell, so I decided I could trick all of you by using his first name that he doesn't go by. So Pastor Mark, you're kind of catching on to what's going on. You heard the prayer. You're hearing the children's story. Pastor Mark has served, and remember, here's a little boy who fell out of the car, but God had a plan for him. Here's a little boy who wanted to be a missionary, but God had a plan for him. And then there was a young man, a teenager, who got discouraged and wasn't really following God, but God had a plan for him. And a college student who got discouraged, but God had a plan for him. And in Pastor Mark's 40 years, this, this month, August, is his 40th year of pastoral ministry. Pastor Mark has pastored, I, I counted, honey, you have pastored over 4,000 church members in your 40 years of ministry. And numerous other people that he meets on the street. Here's pictures of him baptizing. We'll just keep the pictures moving. There's pictures of him. He, he was able to do camp meetings and love the elderly and coach the, the uh, Adventist University baseball team. And he loves older people. Look, he's in a race with an older lady with, with, a, um, with a walker at, at graduations and baby dedications and Pathfinder events and praying with his his church family and praying with people on their deathbed and reading the bible to them and doing hundreds of worships at our adventist schools over the years baptizing all four of his children preaching here at campus hill church and this is what i want to leave you guys with this is something that Pastor Mark posted this week, and that's actually a quote that's SME, Stephen Mark Etchell. Every person is a story. You are each a story. When a Christian interacts with people, Jesus becomes part of their story. So every time that you are on the playground with your friends and you do something with them, you're Jesus to them by being loving and kind, or you're not Jesus to them by being unloving and unkind. So we can always touch people's lives. And I think there's another picture. And here Pastor Mark is showing by example, coloring a picture with young people on his lap. And the last one, I just want to remind you, there is no other you. The picture of our church here is not complete if we're missing the blue crayon or the red crayon or the green crayon or any of the color of crayons. Each one of us has a vital part of ministry here. So right now, um, I'm gonna ask all of you young people to stay here on the platform, okay? And we're gonna have just a little something different than we normally do. Elder Hope is going to lead here for just a minute. And I'd also like to invite Pastors Kiprib, uh, Christian, 
and Shifra and the Elder Obed to come here with me. As you've heard, it's Pastor Mark's 40th year in ministry, which he just completed. And as he enters his 41st year in ministry here at Campus Hill, we'd like to pray a special blessing on him for an extra measure of the Holy Spirit and also for guidance and wisdom as he ministers to us here. You know, uh, number 40 is important in the Bible. You remember Moses spent 40 days with the Lord when he gave him the law, the Ten Commandments? Do you know that Elijah ate one meal and it was enough for 40 days? Uh, do you know how many days did uh, Jonah preach to uh, Nineveh? How many days did our Savior Jesus Christ fast it? 40 days. 40. Maybe, Pastor Mark, you need to fast 40 days. <laughs> The Israelites wandered. <laughs> the Israelites wandered 40 years in the wilderness, and it took me 40 years to get here to Loma Linda. So I'm I'm entering the promised land. I want to say that we appreciate Pastor Mark. Shall we give him a round of applause? Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, you are God of gods and Lord of lords. We humbly come to thy presence and bow down because we are filled with excitement and gratitude for Pastor Mark, for his spirit of commitment, enduring dedication, tireless service in ministry throughout 40 years. On this earth, we know 40 years is a long time. And for some of us know that 40 years is not smooth. It has many, many storms and challenges. Over the decades, through you, Pastor Mark has led so many souls to Christ. Father, we are encouraged by his steadfast and faithfulness in you. We join him and his family to thank you and to celebrate the miraculous milestone in this remarkable journey with you. We know and believe that he is an answer to our humble prayers. You have called him to lead the flock, your flock of Campus Hill Church. Father, our hearts are moved with your vision and your plans for Campus Hill Church and this community demonstrated through Pastor Mark. We boldly ask that your hand, the mighty hand, will lead and direct his path in righteousness. In this spiritual journey, Father, may your light be his companion, your love be his constant guide. And the rod and staff, they always comfort him. Overflow him with your prudence. Shield him with your might. And empower him with your Holy Spirit. Father, we lift the entire Agile family to thy throne. Continue to surround them with your everlasting joy and love so they may be perpetual beacons of your light in your world. For we ask all this in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior's precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
And Lord, I say amen to my brother's prayer. And Father, I pray that as Paul wrote to the church, imitate me as I imitate Christ. I hope and pray that your servant, Pastor Mark, will be the one who will show us the Father and bless him and may all the people he served in the 40 years past be blessed and one day all of us we will see many in your kingdom who came and know you through our humble service i pray father bless this church that we all love bless pastor christian and bless uh, pastor shepra Father, help us all to work together because we are living in the end of time. We need to be ready for Jesus to come. Father, thank you because you called us all to be pastors, to serve, to preach, to show the world your love, your salvation, are your coming in glory. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So Mark, we have a little gift for you and hope that it will help you in your ministry as you move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hopefully it's not a new paper cutter. <laughs> First of all, I want to say I think whoever is the teachers of all of you young people are very lucky. Did our young children and young people do an amazing job through those prayers of dedications? I'm going to say amen. I think the teachers who get to teach you are lucky people. I want to remind you that when we are missing one of the colors, we are missing part of what Jesus has for all of us. And as Pastor Katrib said in his prayer, each one of us are pastors. Right now, I would like all of you young people to stand up Anybody who is a student, I'm not going to call you up. Any student or educator, please stand. And we're going to have a very short but special prayer of dedication for our students and educators for this school year. So can you stand up right now on the steps? Let's stand up. And any students in the congregation and any educators, please stand. Thank you. And we're going to have one more prayer. We get to talk to Jesus again. Dear Lord, thank you so much for the people who have dedicated their lives to teaching and training young people. Lord, you know each one who is an educator in our church, those who are here today, those who are not here. Lord, I pray that you will bless them in a mighty way. For those who have spent years of dedication as teachers and are no longer teaching, Lord, I pray that you will continue to bless them for the mighty efforts that they have given over the years. And Lord, right now, I was praying in a very special way for each one of the young people who are up here in front this morning and those standing in the congregation. And again, Lord, those who are not here, be with our young people, bless them, put your Holy Spirit over them and cover them daily as they get up out of bed, as they head out the door, and they face the world that doesn't always have you in it, Jesus. So be with our young people. Give them the sword of righteousness and the armor of faith, and Lord, I pray that you will help them to be Jesus to others at school each day. We love you. Amen.
Good morning, church, and happy Sabbath. When we give a gift to someone we love, the giver and the receiver experience joy. Sometimes we give a gift to a person as a way of showing appreciation for something they did. Ellen White reminds us that the gifts are to be made in consideration of the great goodness of God to us. Today we are giving an offering for our local church. The offering will support the ministries and the programs of our congregation. Our church is a part of God's family, and we are truly giving to God. We give joyfully because we have experienced God's goodness to us. Let us return God's tithe and give an offering to our local church today. Uh, may the deacons rise. Dear Jesus, Thank you for all the blessings you have given to us. Bless the pockets that will give joyfully out of your goodness to them. And may the, whole, the power of the Holy Spirit be with us. Amen. Amen.
Good morning and happy Sabbath, Campus Hill family. I have a video I would like to show you, but just before we show you this video, I have to introduce to you the special young lady that God chose to go with me to Papua New Guinea on the mission trip. She survived being my roommate, and she is willing enough to come here and tell us how God used her to bless over a thousand people and 500 plus kids. So I'd like you to give a Campus Hill welcome to Fitu Tase. So um, the movie or the video, it's just a two minute clip. Uh, we wanna show you some of the faces of the people that we got to meet. Uh, it, remember if you hadn't heard, if you didn't hear me say before, it's a 14 hour flight that we took from LAX to Manila. Then we had about a day's worth of layover and then another flight from uh, Manila to Port Moresby, which is the capital of Papua New Guinea. So that was about what, five hours? And then from Port Moresby, the capital, we took a little turbo plane to the Highlands, which is where the, um, the specific province we went to is the highest um, level or highest land elevation in Papua New Guinea. So this is us in Enga province. Hello to all the people of Eastern Enga. I just want to say thank you so much for all of the parents who brought their kids tonight. They were amazing. Yeah, happy Sabbath. Thank you. Yeah. I love you guys so much. And who is our best friend? Jesus. Keep smiling. Remember, keep smiling. 45, tell your mom and dad to bring you and bring your brothers and sisters and friends, OK? Happy Sabbath, everyone. Uh, my name is Luck Shevinlin Marie Kalameli Tase, but you just can call me Fitu because that's way much easier. Um, I was born and raised in San Diego in Vista, California, and I was born and raised in the church as well. And that's how I remember and know Shifra, right? Um, my sister in Christ. Um, I recently graduated this past month actually this past June in high school. And um, I celebrated with some of our family and our family friends and our church family as well. And Shifra's parents came to my celebration. We had a barbecue. And I asked them, how's Shifra doing? Like, what is she up to? And her mom said, oh, she's actually going on a mission trip to Papua New Guinea. I was like, where is that? Never heard of that before. <laughs> And so she told me about the mission trip, and I was, I was instantly, I was very interested. I, ha I, like, I felt something in my heart that told me, you have to go. And 
And um, after that day of my celebration, I went home and I told my parents that I wanted to go on this mission trip with Shifra, with the Quiet Hour Ministry. And they were so excited. It's not every day that your, parent, your children come to you and tell you that they want to serve God on a mission trip that's across the entire world. And you won't see them for a couple of weeks, so they're kind of you know, anxious to see what's going to happen, especially when you're so young. Because I'm only 18 years old, and I'm fresh out of high school. Um, but I knew I had to go, and I've always wanted to go to serve a mission um, for God. Because I've always seen these, all these missionaries go and serve or like in these different countries, even in our own country. And so much joy is brought to these people. They bring so much happiness and hope to these people. And I've always, one of the things that I love to do is make people smile and bring happiness to people. And so instantly I wanted to go. Um, you can always send money to these countries and always send money to these missionaries to help out and to um, fund their construction, but actually going there and building relationships and bonding with the people makes a bigger difference than just sending the money there. You get to learn more about them, feel a better connection, and you can't just buy a relationship with God for others. You have to build it on your own. And especially when you take your time, take your time out of your busy life and going out there and spreading God's word and showing that you actually care for them, it can really get them through so many rough times in their life. Knowing that there's someone across the, across the ocean, the whole half of the earth, knowing that there's someone there that cares for you really gives them a lot of hope in their life. So right when I told my parents, um, they were so excited until I told them how much it was to go. <laughs> and they were like, you might as well cut off your arm and two of both of your ears and get, sell it for that money. And I was like, well, if that's how, that, that's what we're going to have to do, I guess that's what's going to happen. <laughs> um, but they were, they were very discouraged when they found out that it would be so much money to pay the Quiet Hour Ministry, plus your flight there, because we have so many bills and so many things to pay off that we can't just pull out four grand out of our pockets and be like, all right, go ahead, go serve the Lord. But that did not stop me. That did not, I did not end it there. At first, I was like, okay, I guess I'm just going to go back to, you know, doing whatever I used, I, I'm always doing. But I prayed to God first. I asked him, God, if this is your will, then it will happen. Um, after that, I told my parents, it's like, you tell me every day, whenever, whenever you guys have financial hardships, you always say, don't worry about that. Don't worry about the bills. God has all of the money in the world. He has all of the riches in heaven. All you have to do is get on your knees and pray to him and ask him. And if it's his will, and he will give it to you. So, so every morning and every night, I prayed. I asked God, God, is this what you want me to do? Do you want me to go out there to Papua New Guinea and spread your word? Do you want me to show these people your love and introduce you to these people? Because if you want me to, please help me. Please provide me all the equipment I need to go out there and do your work. And the very first week, I, I, I told everyone, I told my family, my family friends, my church family, everyone, I told them about how I wanted to go and wanted to serve on this mission. And that very first week of finding out about this mission trip, I raised $700 of donation. And right after I received all that money, I got on my knees and prayed to God gave him the things that he deserved. Because I knew if it wasn't for him, none of this, not a single penny would be donated. So on that Sunday, I did a bake sale for my fundraising. My mom makes the best half moon pineapple pies and coconut German buns. It's like a signature, it's like a, it's, it's her signature like dish that she makes that everyone would be running from miles to come get some. 
And so we had our, we had our fundraiser, and she, right when the sun set it on Sabbath, we began to bake. We baked from 8 p.m. till 12 in the noon the next day. We did not sleep. Well, my mom didn't sleep. Like, I slept a little bit, but she, slept. she did not sleep. She did not sleep. And she continued to make her, her pies and her German buns. And in the morning, when we got all of the donations and all of the money put together, we counted $1,200. $1,200 in one day. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen? amen. So the next Sunday, we held another fundraiser, another bake sale. But we did this in Oregon. We were going to Oregon for a family annual uh, rafting trip. And we, we decided to, like, might as well, you know? Everyone up there loves it, so, you know. So we did our fundraiser, and we raised $900 in that, on that one seven day. Can I get another amen? <laughs> and then when we came back the next week, we did our very final fundraiser. And we told everyone, this is your last chance to get your pineapple pies and your German buns. And everyone came racing with their wallets, coming, buying their, their, um, their goodies, and donating. And we raised $2,100 on that Sunday. That was only three weeks that we raised $4,200. My trip, my overall trip, with the, for the fees and the, my passport I did not have, so I had to get, an, um, I had to get that really ex um, expedited. And I needed my passport. I needed my fees for the Quiet Hour Ministry program, ministry, um, and also for my flight. And I only needed four grand. But I got $4,000 and 200. That was not counting the donations that came throughout the week. That was just for my fundraising. God is so good. And as long as you believe and trust that he will come through, he will always come through for every single need, financially, physically, mentally, all of it. So I called Quiet Hour Ministry, and I was, and right before I, call, I was going to call them to pay, because there's three different payments. You have to pay the $300 deposit, $750, and then the second $750. So I was going to call them for the 300 deposit, but Shifra called me, and she said, oh, don't worry about your deposit. One of the ladies um, canceled her trip, and she wanted to donate it to you. I got on my knees, and I prayed. I don't know what other true God there is besides our only God. So I got on my knees, and I prayed, and I thanked him. At that moment, I knew that God wanted me to go. I knew that there was a purpose for me to go out there and to spread his word. So the next week, um, I paid the 750 and then Shifra calls me three days later, says, don't worry about the second 750 God covered it. I only had to pay $750 out of the 1800 to the Quiet Hour Ministry. And not only that, our plane ticket was $1,900 to get there and back. He lowered the prices to $1,700. As long as we know that our God is always there for us, as long as we share his love and have a good heart and always trust in him, never lose your faith no matter what you are going through, financially, anything, always trust that he has a plan for you. Thank you so much. Good morning. Um, today I will be reading from the book of Genesis, chapter 29, verses 17 and 31 through 35. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. 
When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, for she said, it is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely now my husband will love me. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. Again she conceived, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, now at last my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. So she named him Levi. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, this time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah. Then she stopped having children. Thank you.
Thank you so much for the beautiful harmonies of praise in the house of the Lord. Um, thank you for welcoming Fitu, and thank you, Fitu, for sharing your testimony. Now, I believe you're not the only one here. You brought your family, too, so I don't know if the cameras can get them. They're on my left on the ground. We have, um, if you just want to wave your hand, we have Nate, we have Fono, we have Jojo, we have JJ and Gigi. Can you just wave your hands? Because I'm sure you were part of a half moon pie bake sale. If you want to stand too, you can, if that's all right. So welcome. We're so thankful that you were there. I know that some of you think that the secret to Fitu's going um, successfully with enough funds is the recipe to those German buns and the half moon pie, but I think the point was that her secret to success was her faith. Can I get an amen? See, if you don't know how to bake, if you don't know how to fundraise, because you've got all those skills, <laughs> you can still enjoy the purpose of God for your life if you but trust in the Lord your God. Trust will move mountains, right? Faith will move mountains. If you trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and acknowledge him in all your ways, he will direct your paths. So I'm just going to ask God, that same one that we trust and that we've heard is trustworthy, um, to bless our time in the word today. Pray with me. God, thank you very much for being trustworthy and for sending Jesus Christ to show us that we can trust you. I want to lean into you this morning, this afternoon, uh, with my church family, that we would all lean in for a closer walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Genesis chapter 29, 29 is where we're going to be at. I've chosen the Bible character Leah, not only because she's a woman, but because of the lessons that we can learn from this woman's life. So A Closer Walk, this is the series that's going to talk about a really juicy story between two sisters. See, this is a two-for-one deal. I know I said Leah, but really you can't talk about Leah in the Bible if you ain't going to talk about Rachel. Leah and Rachel are the sisters, daughters of Laban, and they are in this fascinating story of being chosen or being chosen over. So in Genesis chapter 29, that was me stalling for you to get a Bible in the front front of you in the pew or to get the Bible that you charged out and swiped over to verse 16 to 18. I think we have those verses for you to follow. Genesis chapter 29, verse 16 to 18. Thank you, Gage, for reading this already. Um, can we get the verses up for everyone to see in case they don't have a Bible? Genesis chapter 29, verse 16 says, I'm going to read in my version. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. So there we have a little bit more information. We know that um, Leah, it's okay. Okay, so we only have the PowerPoint. That's fine. Um, thank you, Pastor Mark. We know that Leah was older and Rachel was younger. But there's a little bit more there. In verse 17, it tells us Leah's eyes were delicate or weak. Some straight up say she was ugly. I don't know what version you're using. But Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. Whatever the original manuscript really means, we can tell that there's a physical difference between these sisters. One has weak eyes, delicate eyes. And Rachel was beautiful physically beautiful. Not only that, if we go over to verse 30, in the same chapter, see, we got to build up the tension and just get started right there. Genesis chapter 29, verse 30 says, to make matters worse in terms of comparing the two sisters and one feeling ashamed from the other, we hear that Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah. This morning, this sermon is for those who know the pains of feeling second best, less than, not enough, and passed over. This sermon is to encourage each person in any area of life where you have felt sized up and wanting, that God is in the habit 
of picking people who are passed over, and we're going to see that in Leah's life. This word is a word to encourage the Leahs, but then a plot twist to also encourage the Rachels. So in, in Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30, in, to 30, you find Leah's name. Not a lot of people know this, but in some way, or shape, or form, we do find Leah's name in Matthew chapter 11. Because in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30, it says, maybe you know it, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Leah's name means weary. Come to me, all you Leah's. Come to me, all you who are weary. All you who feel passed up and passed over. All you who feel like you are lacking when others measure you up. Come to me, all you who are weary, Jesus says, and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And so let's look at a little bit of Leah's story here. It says, Jacob loved Rachel in verse 18 and had to work seven extra years, even though he had Rachel, because he was deceived with Leah by, by their father, by Laban. He thought he was working for the one he loved, the one that was physically more beautiful, but when it came to the big celebration day, they must have, mu there, it must have been a party, some kind of party where he really couldn't see her or maybe other things as well very clearly. Because when he wakes up, it's not Rachel, who he had thought he was working for, but instead it's Leah, who he didn't really want. If you've ever felt like you were in a bad situation, where you're, you're, you're put into a position, but you're not wanted in that position, this story is for you. Jacob unabashedly says, this is not the woman I worked for. Give me your other daughter, Rachel. And so they strike a deal, and he works for seven more years for Rachel. And so these sisters become sister wives. And, you know, <laughs> this is one of the stories that you don't really want to shed a spotlight on, because... You know, you just try to focus on the places where Jacob and the ladder, Jacob and him becoming Israel. But I love that the Bible does not leave these details out so that when you feel um, like the same way that these Bible characters did, falling short, unwanted, um, passed over, you can learn the treasures that are in these stories. So I love Leah. I love Leah because she reminds me that our system of measuring ourselves and measuring each other in this world is upside down in comparison to how the kingdom of heaven does it. Um, any students in this house, any students, just raise your hand. Anybody that used to be a student and knows what it's like to stress over grades. Okay, so there's some empathy here. You know, it's so interesting because grades are really, do you remember as a young student or not so young, when your world sometimes can like revolve around getting those grades? Or maybe your world didn't revolve around the getting those grades, but your parents thought it should, you know? And it's like, man, if you don't get those grades, what really were you doing, right? And so we use these different ways of measuring um, your, your place, measuring whether you should be somewhere. And you can make all kinds of cases. I mean, I, I really worked hard for those grades too, and I remember crying when I didn't get grades I liked. But here in the Word of God, we find that there is a different way that God measures us. And I, I believe we find it in verse 34. So let's go to Genesis chapter 29, verse 34. Mm. No. Genesis chapter 29, verse 31. It says, When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb. 
but Rachel was barren. What is so important about that verse is not so much the last part of it, where one becomes fertilely fruitful, <laughs> that's a word, and the other not, but that the Lord saw. Verse 31 of chapter 29 says, when the Lord saw, and, and those who study the Bible and the patterns between both the Old Testament and New Testament know that when the author uses that phrase that the Lord saw, something about deliverance is about to happen. When the Lord saw Hagar in the wilderness, when the angel of the Lord came to her upon her distress, when the Lord sees you, it is the beginning of your deliverance. Here it says, when the Lord saw, and that's all you need to know, as a reader of the word of God, as one who is walking with the Father, holding his hand, you know that if God sees you, he will deliver you. That's the end of the story. When the Lord saw Leah, that she was unloved, he opened her womb because guess what? Even though God doesn't play our games, he can come in to take away your disgrace even in the midst of those games. So in comes God to give her something to lift her up because I think it is in the word of God where it says, oh, you're last? Yeah, that means in my kingdom you're first. I'm sorry, sir, you're first. You can go back over there to the end of the line. The, flip, the script is constantly flipped in Jesus Christ. He turns our way of thinking and makes it upside down. The least of these, those who are marginalized, have a place in the kingdom, and that place is highly exalted in the exaltation of Jesus Christ. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, God started to pour down his love on Leah in a very special way. Watch out when God starts loving on people that aren't loved. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, and see, this is where it gets tricky, but listen to what Leah says. The Lord has surely looked on my affliction. She knows that God saw her on her distress. The Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, and this is where I wish Leah would have just stopped with that first sentence. Now I know the Lord has seen me in my affliction, but she had to go on, and that's because she's real, and the Bible doesn't leave out these beautiful details to help us in our insecurities. Watch this. She says, now, therefore, my husband will love me. You know, peace and contentment only come through one thing, acceptance. When you know that you're accepted, there's a sense of peace, a sense of contentment, a sense of confidence even. Some of you may not know the, these two next words put together, but Queen Latifah, she is someone that when I was younger, I used to think, man, if I could just be confident like her, just thinking about her, I thought, you know, her shoulders are poised. She had just this aura about her. Not that she was egotistical or haughty, but she just carried herself, you know, with this serene sense of confidence. I have to say, when you walk around knowing that you're okay, there's a difference in your shoulders. There's a difference in your chin. When you know that you're accepted, by the ones who matter. There's a difference in your inside and your outside. It shows. Here we find sisters, not just Leah, but also Rachel, struggling in a human experience, which is to be accepted, but going about it in every, any other way except of Jesus. They're looking to be accepted, and so Leah, she chooses the path of approval. She wants to be accepted by someone else's approval. Would you just validate me? Rachel, let's go ahead to her. 
Rachel starts seeing that Leah is popping out those sons. First she has Reuben, next she has Simeon, then she has Levi, and then she has Judah, and for a little bit she stops bearing. And now in chapter 30, verse 1, it says not that God saw, but that somebody else saw. In your Bible, chapter 30, verse 1, who's the one that's seeing now? Rachel. Now when Rachel saw, see, there's a difference when God sees. When God sees, deliverance is coming. <laughs> but if you start looking through the lens of either your own human eyes or the lens of someone else's human eyes, deliverance is being delayed. Right here in chapter 30, verse 1, now when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, Rachel envied. Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, give me children or else I die. Now this is a sister who is looking for acceptance, not through the path of approval, but through the path of accomplishment. She wants to produce just like Leah is producing. Leah wants to be loved just like Rachel is loved. She wants to be wanted like Rachel is wanted, but if she's not going to get wanted, at least she can give something by producing something that the other can't. Either way that you go about it, if we're looking for acceptance in any other well but the living well, you're not going to be satisfied and your thirst ain't going to be quenched. If Jesus is not enough, nothing else will be enough for you and me. And when we find that Jesus is enough, then you find that you too are quite enough. Peace and confidence come from knowing that you are accepted. In the body of Christ, no matter who you are, no matter your past, your present, no matter the predictions of your future, in Jesus Christ you are accepted and fully loved. You are wanted and you will produce even more fruit. You want the acceptance? You want the, through the path of accomplishment? Jesus can give that to you. But you got to get it in order. First the relationship, first the closer walk with Jesus, and then the production of an abundant supply of fruit. You want the wanting, you want to be desired, you want the acceptance of other people's approval and other people's approval, first the closer walk with Jesus, and then you will find that not only do you have favor with God, but you also have favor with men and women. So Leah, who is named weary, has to learn that those who are weary must come to Jesus, because only there will you find rest. So, okay, Rachel gets envy, yes, of her sister, and I think some more drama happens here. Give me children or else I die. And Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel and says, Am I in the place of God who has withheld you from the fruit of the womb? So she said, Here's my maid. She takes things into her hand. You see, deliverance just gets delayed. But even when you make mistakes, even when you sin, even when you fail because you've taken your, your life into your own hands, I have great news for us. According to the gospel in Jesus Christ, God's purposes and God's plans account for your mistakes. And so here we have the story where Rachel now gives her servant, and Leah sees that, and that it's successful. Bilhah starts producing, and so Leah gives Jacob Zilpah, and Zilpah starts producing. And then finally, here we see that um, verse 22, very interesting, because Leah started producing the same way. Rachel thought she could get her servant to kind of redeem her, but Leah was able to do the same. And so in verse 22, it says... Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her. God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. And she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my disgrace. Very quickly, because our time has come and gone, and I still have a quick testimony to close us with, 
Leah's story is not the only story in the Bible. And if we were really honest with ourselves, we would also find places where we can resonate and relate. David, David was passed over. Do you remember? The prophet of the Lord comes to the house of Jesse and says, where are your sons? And the sons line up. And one by one, he's going through the line. And the prophet says, you know, God hasn't given the prophet an okay for any of the sons in the lineup. And so he says, is there one more? I mean, Jesse didn't even include his son David in the lineup when the prophet came to make a house visit. David was utterly passed over. But God is in the habit of picking people who are passed over. So when David, who is passed over, walks over to the house because God hasn't given his stamp of approval only until David is coming and David is the chosen one, then God speaks to the prophet and says, this is the king, anoint him. And uh, also I think of Jesus. Jesus is another story of someone being passed over, an ultimate story of someone being passed over. If you think of um, Matthew chapter 27, the story of Barabbas, Barabbas and Jesus, here we have two, as if they're on the same footing. Which would you like to an angry crowd? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus the one who says he's the Messiah? And the crowd angrily yells, give us Barabbas, release him, we choose him. You can crucify Jesus. Jesus is passed over, but like we've been learning this morning and afternoon, is that God is in the habit of picking people who have been passed over. And so the last thing here I was going to uh, bring up is, can we jump to the, the last slide? I'll just skip the second slide. Time has gone. Yep, that's a good one. There we go. So there's a story I want to share with you um, about, that I also shared in Papua New Guinea, about two babies, twins, in a mother's womb. Um, this story of Leah is around the womb of a woman, or two women, really. And it reminded me that all life is from God. It, it also reminded me that when, you know, sins get in the way, whether your sins or other people's sins, God's plans account for those sins. Before the foundations of the earth were laid, the plan of salvation had already been made. God's purposes account for human sin and human failure. God is great. And so I was reminded of that. And I was also reminded that all life comes from God. That there are no accidental children that come out of the production of someone's pain and insecurities and shame. There's, there's children, there's parents that feel that way, but children are the product or the blessing and the gift of a God who gives life. John 14 verse 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the story that I told in Papua New Guinea was of two kids, it's just an imaginary story, of two little babies, if you imagine, one boy, one girl, they're twins, talking to each other in their mother's womb. And one brother is very, this brother is very skeptical, very cynical brother already in his formation. And the sister is very hopeful and kind of an optimistic outlook, and she has something special she senses. So she tells her brother, you know, I believe that this is not all there is. I believe that there's more to life than just this dark place. And the brother said, what would ever give you an idea that there's more to life than this dark place? And why would we ever wanna go anywhere else? Here we get fed, here it's nice and cozy. You have me, I have you. And she said, no, I, I really sense that there is a new place and we're getting ready to go to that new place. There's a life beyond this life. And you know what, even more, I believe, I believe that there is something called a mother. And the brother said, oh, you've lost your mind now. There is no such thing. Have you even seen the, this thing called mother? You've never seen a mother. I've never seen a mother. How can there be a mother? And the sister said, oh, just you wait. I believe that there is something called a mother and I believe that there is another life than just this one in this dark place. 
because haven't you felt those pains, those squeezes? And the brother said, yeah, I've felt those squeezes and pains. I don't like them. And she said, well, I believe that those pains and those squeezes are just getting us ready to be delivered into the life we're actually designed to live. You see, all life comes from God. And the kind of life that God wants to give us is a life that we cannot even imagine right now in this side of eternity. It's more than we can ask or imagine. It's greater than anything we've ever experienced. We don't have to look for paths of acceptance through our own works and our own merits. Through Jesus Christ, he is the resurrection and the life. If you want life, you need Jesus. And in Jesus, you have eternal life. So uh, to close, I'm going to ask for a really short snippet from Vitu um, Tase to make an appeal to you. As you, I want, to think, want you to think about this. I want you to think about where your life is. Are you getting ready for the new life to come? You've seen evidence of pain, squeezes in your life that cause you maybe to suffer for a moment, but have you ever considered that that squeeze and that pain could be getting you ready to be delivered into the new life to come? Where are you in your life? Do you believe that there is a mother who cares for you, who is nourishing you, even if you can't see it? That is a picture of God, your maker. And did you know that only your maker can ever measure you? Only your maker can ever measure you. Only your maker is the true mirror of who you are and your worth. So I want you to consider, where are you in your life today? Fitu has a very powerful, powerful testimony. And I got told before we came up here, take your time. And I got told that when guest speakers come, you, we have a little extra grace for time when they come. So Fitu has a powerful story about her in her own mother's womb and how she has been able to connect that to God's purpose in her life. So real quick. Happy Sabbath once again. <laughs> Um, so this testimony I have for you guys, um, so my mom, she is our prayer warrior in our family. She, she has had cancer, leukemia, since she was a young teenager, and she still does have it, but she's on remission right now, so she's okay, guys. <laughs> she also had troubles um, conceiving a child, and when her and my dad got married, that was the only thing they wanted to do, like, wanted to have as a child. They prayed day and night and asked God, and they even fasted so many times so they would, they would be able to have a healthy child. My mom had miscarriages many times. She had miscarriages after miscarriages after miscarriages. And then so for after many years, finally after all those tears and all those all that pain and all those miscarriages, she kept her faith and she continued to pray and ask God, please bless me with at least one child. So then within, within those many years, God blessed her with a healthy daughter and she was so grateful. And then two years later, another daughter, which is my sister back there, <laughs> She, and after two years, another son, or one son, actually. And then after another two years, another son. And after a while, she's like, all right, um, it's a bit too many kids there, but. And then after two years, another daughter. Another two years, another daughter. And she was like, all right, that's enough. I need to chill out. You know, this is too many kids. The house is getting full. So. After that, after having six kids, being blessed with God, she tied her tubes. <laughs> yep, she tied them tubes. She was like, oh, no, that's enough kids for me. I'm okay. Thank you, God, but I'm okay. Um, so in the late 90s, my family migrated from Samoa to America, in California, so southern California. And in late 2000, December, in the late December, my mom started leaking blood. And so she rushed to the ER and she asked the doctor, doctor, is my cancer back? I'm in so much pain. Is it back? And he said, no. Um, actually, 
you're pregnant. She's like, what? What do you mean I'm pregnant? I tied my tubes like a while ago. It's impossible. But, God said, but the doctor said, no. Yep, you see this? Yeah, that's a baby. It's a girl. <laughs> it was me. <laughs> She thought, she believed that the cancer, all the, I was seven months in her, in her womb. She thought it was her cancer creeping back in, but no, it was God slipping in another child for her. Yeah. So my mother was in so much pain. And all she said to the doctor, get her out. Come on, get her out. I'm, t my, my, I'm, I'm in so much pain. Please get her out. And I was... Two months early, I was a premature baby, but I was healthy. I was in the hospital for a while, but then I made it out a healthy baby, one of the healthiest babies. She, the reason why my first name is Luck, it's not because I was lucky to be the only one born in America, not because I was, the only, I was born on December 31st, New Year's Eve. It was because I was lucky enough to be chosen by God no matter, about, no matter the possibilities of me ever seeing the day or night, he still had me in this world. God had his own plans. Even though my mom tried to stop me from coming out, tying her tubes and thinking I would never be alive, God had his own plans. It was never his fault. It was always his purpose. Even when my mom didn't want me, she didn't want another child. God wanted her to have another child. God wanted me to be born. He wanted me to live regardless of the lowest of possibilities. And he wanted me to spread his word in Papua New Guinea. And he wanted me to stand up here in front of you guys and testify his love. I want to ask you a question, P2. I saw you were at the end of your notes, and you still have one more thing you haven't said. Um, when you went to Papua New Guinea, the rest of the team went somewhere, and you and I visited a campus, and now that campus is part of your story. Do you want to? I know you want to share. So when I graduated high school, my plan was to go to a community college and to major in political science, because I love bringing joy to people. It's one of my, like, it's one of the things that makes me, me, you know? And I wanted to major in political science and become, you know, don't laugh at me, but I wanted to be the president because I wanted to make a world a better place. I knew, I believed that I would be able to do that as long as you trust and believe in God. But before starting school, I traveled to Papua New Guinea with Shifra here and the Quiet Hour Ministry. And sharing God's love and spreading his word really made me genuinely happy. Not only me, no, not only I was happy, but the people were happy. They, were, they had only one pair of shirt, like of clothes. They would wear the same thing every day because that's all they had. They didn't have phones, they didn't have cars, they didn't have all these luxuries that we have here in America, but they were happy. Their government wasn't as, wasn't even close to ours. There was a tribal war when we were there, during the week we were there. But they were still happy because they were spiritually fed. And so the major that I changed, I changed my major once I came back. Instead of doing political science, I chose pastoral ministry because I believe that <laughs> spreading his word would be more effective for the people and, make, and spread true happiness in the world. Thank you. You can just stand here with me. Um, um, we've got our team here for closing, for closing song. But I do want to appeal to you that you think about these things for your life. And if you haven't chosen Jesus, for you to choose Jesus today. You are created for a better life than this life. There is such a thing as eternal life. And there is deliverance because God sees you. And the way God measures you because he's your maker is more than you can ever ask or imagine. The love that God has for you is unfathomable. 
the love of God is yours today in Christ Jesus. I encourage you to reach for those blue cards in the pew. If you're interested in Bible studies, check that you want Bible studies. If you want a pastoral visit, you need prayer. Maybe you've given your life years ago, but you need a refresher, you need encouragement. Our elders are here to visit you. Take those blue cards and you can give it to one of our pastors or elders at the end when you walk out through the door. Will you stand with us as we sing what a friend we have in Jesus, amen. the benediction, Pastor Schiffer's benediction, and the postlude, all are invited to join Pastor Mark outside in front on the steps of the church for a group family, church family picture. <laughs> so after the postlude is over, please come out quickly and join us for a picture. Amen. You think that seven kids are big? The church family is big. So I'm looking forward to that church uh, family picture. Now Leah gave birth to Judah. Judah is where Jesus comes from. The line of the woman who was unwanted was the line that God wanted for Jesus to come through. When you feel a certain way, know that God is working in your life for Jesus to come through your life. So I pray a benediction over this church family, that in the areas where we have felt ashamed, that we will feel an abundance and experience and receive an abundance of God's grace that can only come in Jesus Christ. Lord, where we have felt passed over, that we will know that you have picked us up. Lord, where we have felt unwanted, that we will know you have taken that, which others may have meant for harm, to make for good, so that Jesus can come through our lives. 
I thank you for lifting us up this morning. Go with us now, and especially anyone who has made the decision to follow you. Here with me is Fitu Tase. Anoint her in the name of Jesus as she has chosen you for your calling and purpose in her life, which is greater than we can even imagine. And I thank you for all of these things and more. In Jesus' name, amen. Join us for the family picture. <laughs> 